Hello, everybody. Welcome to Chapter 12, Internal Employee Relations. Hopefully, we'll be able to get this done in eh, about 40 minutes, I think. Usually, this is going to be a little bit of a shorter lecture, but we do have some pretty important ground to cover. I think when we talk about employee relations and we talk about HR, I think that's what a lot of people think of. They think of what happens when I'm in trouble, what happens if I have a problem, who do I go to, sort of where management and employees meet is in HR. So we get involved in terminations, we get involved in employee discipline, we get involved in some of the more messy situations where we have to manage people's movement in the organization, but also keep in mind organizational goals as well as legal compliance. So internal employee relations, when we talk about that, we're talking about how people move in the organization, promotions, demotions, hiring, terminating, suspension, etc. It also talks about the relationship between employees and employers. The responsibility of HR is to protect the company, not to protect managers, not to protect employees. Make no mistake, HR is not your friend. So when you come to HR, typically when I've got that hat on, I want to help you. I do. I do want to help you. I do want you to work out as an employee. I want you to feel good. I want you to feel comfortable. I also want to make sure that we have a good environment, that we have a good culture, that we don't have a place where people feel afraid or where people feel like they have no voice. So it is important that companies listen to the employees and me and HR that I listen to the employees. But also, overall, my goal is to protect the company, keep us going and keep us running. So I don't protect managers. I don't protect employees. I protect the company as a party in interest. And sometimes that means I advocate on behalf of employees. Sometimes that means that I help managers to find their voice to say the things that need to be said. So it's really a weird position to be in. Um, it's kind of hard to describe. Some people are more side than the others. Some people, you know, it's just like with with sports. You got some coaches that are more of players coaches, and some coaches that are organization coaches that are not really on the players side. I like to think of HR though as as the responsibility of making conditions right for people to do the right things and that means that people can kind of do what they want you don't sweat the small stuff i'm not a big rule guy i'm not somebody who uh, kind of likes to to advise management to manage people out i don't really like that you know if we can find ways for people to be successful and for everybody to be happy I know it's cliche, but win-win. I mean, that should be the goal of HR is win-win. That it's, it's hard to recruit employees. It's much better to save employees. So if we can make them feel more comfortable, if we can make the environment better, sometimes we have to train managers. Sometimes we have to get rid of managers because they're not being effective because people don't feel comfortable. And they they vote with their feet. So when we talk about impl internal employee relations, again, HR is not your friend. They can be your advocate, but they're not. They're certainly not your friend. Uh, but also, you shouldn't, or at least the organization that you work for, shouldn't view HR as a rubber stamp for management. And that's kind of the problem sometimes is that you have HR that's kind of like the 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 police force. I don't like that. Uh, you also have HR that's completely ineffective, where HR may advocate on behalf of employees, but they can't get anything done. They, they feel your pain, they're sympathetic, but they really can't do anything to, to further your cause. Um, so th that sort of middle ground is, if I had to pick one thing that is a skill that's acquired that you can't just show up with, it's, it's the ability to do internal employee relations right. I've been doing this now you know, almost you know, 20, 21, 22 years, and it took me a while. In the very, very beginning, I was way too much on the employee side. I wasn't really on the company side. Then I sort of made a switch, and I went, I went all the way over on the company side, and then I sort of settled back in the middle and kind of found that sweet spot where I can advocate on behalf of employees, but also advise management. So employment at will, I think we hear a lot about this employment at will. Florida is an at will state. Not every uh, not every 
state is an at-will state, but Florida is. It basically means that there are no contracts to your employment unless there is a contract to your employment. So we have to be careful when we set up our policies, when we set up our offer letters, when we set up non-competes, any of the things that we put in front of somebody at time of hire that we don't do anything that will violate at will. So when we look at this, you know, the first exception, so really with it at will, you can't, you can fire somebody for any reason or for no reason is what at will says is that that either party you're you're not bound to the company we'd love for you to give 2 weeks notice but you don't have to give 2 weeks notice the company doesn't have to give you any notice either they can say hey clean out your desk by lunchtime that's their right to do that they can eliminate your job they can eliminate you as an employee they can terminate your employment really for any reason or for no reason but there are some logical exceptions to this and there's also some ticky tack exceptions to it the first one would be implied contract and we have to be very very careful on how we word things there's nothing there that guarantees employment we're very careful on how we word things we don't do temp to perm because nobody's perm there's no permanent employees there are hired employees we say temp to hire we don't say temp to perm anymore the other thing that we have to be careful of too is that when we make offer letters especially for salaried employees we don't say we're offering you a hundred and hundred and four thousand dollars a year I mean, we're not going to say that, or let's just say fifty-two thousand dollars a year. Let's just make life easy. Well, one hundred and four—that's that's double that, right? So we're going to offer a manager one hundred and four thousand dollars a year. So that would equate to being two thousand dollars a week. So we're going to make an offer that we're going to pay you two thousand dollars a week or four thousand dollars biweekly. However, we're going to word that, and then that way that kind of gets us out of any sort of obligation that we're going to pay you through any sort of period of time. So you have to be very, very careful. Managers do make mistakes. There was a mistake that was made with one of our managers that put in an offer letter without having it approved by me that said that you are not eligible to participate in our bonus plan. However, when bonuses come out in March, we will give you a $10,000 bonus. What he didn't put in there was so long as you were still actively employed. So basically, we obligated ourselves in a letter. We made an offer and said, we will pay you this money in, in March. He didn't work for us by then. We had fired him by then. So we made a negotiation with him to pay him a smaller amount. But you have to be very, very careful on what you put in offer letters and really how you communicate things in your employment policies that it doesn't violate at will. Another piece on here is public policy. A public policy termination means that if somebody is abiding by the rules of, let's say, GAP, you know, generally accepted accounting principles, or something that has to do with their licensure, then you can't bring at will, we fired this person because they refused to do their job. In, I think it's 47 states, you can bring uh, public policy defenses for uh, against at will but unfortunately not in florida so if you want to be there's there's anti-whistleblower stuff i mean that stuff's all there i mean if somebody's violating the law and you report them to uh, the government accounting office or you report them to the state of florida as violating the law there are whistleblower protections but there are no public policy protections above and beyond that so there, you know, there's retaliation laws, and you know, term, terminating employment without just cause would be considered an act, uh, act of bad faith and unfair dealing. The thing that 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 employment at will does not protect you from it doesn't protect you from any of the laws that we talked about before. So if somebody is raising a claim of discrimination and you fire them and you say, "Well, I fired them at will," it's it still looks like retaliation. The thing is about enforcing labor law, as we we've talked about before. It is a matter of interpretation based on the courts. And, and typically, it's going to be a matter of interpretation based on how a mediator looks at it. That in order to bring a case, as we've talked about, there's the three-legged stool or the three things that you have to have. You have to have a protection under the law. Number two, you have to have a bad thing that happened to you, a tort, if you will. You got fired. You got demoted. You didn't get a promotion. You got a bad schedule, et cetera, et cetera. Anything bad happens to you. And then the third thing is 
a reasonable causal link between those two things happening, whether it's based on a time frame. So all of those things that we that we've talked about of making sure that our performance appraisals are right and we're not having other things in there. You can't just say, well, I terminate him at will. I can terminate him for any reason at all. But suspiciously, it's at the same time that they raised a complaint because they did not get a promotion over somebody else. So we have to be very, very careful of that. Employment at will is not a get-out-of-jail-free card for violating other parts of employment law that we've talked about. And people think it is. And one thing, too, is there's nothing magical about 90 days. I mean, people have this, this mis- mistaken notion that we can pre- treat people like garbage for 90 days, and then they just throw them out with the trash as long as we get rid of them before 90 days. The only thing special about 90 days, the only thing special about that time period is that court cases and then also with the unemployment office have determined that essentially the 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 90 day mark or anything before the 90 day mark is close enough to the hiring period that really if you were going to discriminate against somebody, you would have done it in the hiring process. You wouldn't have hired them. You wouldn't have brought them on. So therefore, it's not necessarily a protection, but it's just sort of like a reasonable thing. If, if somebody's saying, hey, we're discriminating against people in, based on termination, that if you, if you terminate them, there is a, a sort of an implied thing with 90 days. There's also the fact that you don't have to pay unemployment claims. And that's really it. There's nothing else magical about about 90 days. I mean, if somebody is sexually harassed in the first 90 days and you fire them, they can still bring a sexual harassment suit. They can bring it in on, if they work for you for one day, they can still bring bring a suit against you for unlawful termination or retaliation. So disciplinary action, when we talk about disciplinary action, hopefully if you're in HR, you, people don't have to go to HR for discipline. My whole philosophy on discipline and firing people, you hire them, you fire them. If they're your employee, if they're assigned to you, if you're the one that observed the behavior, then you're the one that is responsible for doing that. Now, there are certain circumstances in certain cases where HR does need to get involved. If somebody's involved in a motor vehicle accident or if they test positive for a drug test or if there's something else that's involved that, that it's more of a compliance issue that we're terminating them for, I may get directly involved in that and I might just say, hey, man, the company he's firing you, your manager's not. You violated a, a cardinal rule that we have, and, and I'm firing you on behalf of the company, but essentially you fired yourself, that you violated this specific policy, and we have no choice other than to terminate you. But I don't generally get involved in discipline or disciplinary action for somebody that's not my direct report. I may be involved just as a witness, and I'm there as a witness sometimes because it might be a case that we might have some EEO exposure. It might be a case of somebody that we've had issues with in the past. We want to make sure that there's a witness. I might be there as a logical witness. I might sit there and add some words to it, but I'm not the one who actually does that. But ultimately, when we look at the disciplinary action, we're looking at what did the employee do? What should they have done? What should they do differently the next time it something happens? And then finally, what's going to happen to them if it continues? And that's really what disciplinary action is. And, and a progressive discipline policy kind of works through that. So we're going to look at the behavior. We're not going to look at the person. We don't look at attitude. We don't look at anything other than behavior. So it's very, very important because it's not subjective. It has to be objective. It's not that the employee was subordinate. It's that the employee yelled in a meeting and used profanity. That's the behavior. That's what we're looking at. The next thing is on here, it shouldn't be applied haphazardly or it shouldn't be applied uh, singling somebody out. I'm not sure what the word is that I'm looking for right now, but we shouldn't be singling anybody out. That When we look at discipline, what's everybody else doing? What are we tolerating? Because sometimes what happens is with employees is somebody gets on your nerves and they get on your nerves, you get, they get on your nerves, they get on your nerves, and finally you just have enough. And it's like, I need to, I need to deal with this. But that may not necessarily be discipline. Maybe that's a meeting first. Maybe we calibrate expectations. So that shouldn't be our initial response. When we find a problem, we shouldn't be constantly documenting and writing people up. Look, people don't want to be treated like they're in high school anymore. They don't want to get demerits. They don't want to get detention. They don't want to have any of those nonsense things that we had when we were growing up. We're adults, and we treat people like adults. So we shouldn't immediately 
be writing up all infractions, writing them up on a slip of paper and having somebody sign something because nobody wants to sign anything. It doesn't feel good to anybody. I don't care what level you're at. I don't care what your role is. Nobody wants to sit in a meeting with their manager and have them slide a piece of paper across to them that they have to sign that they come in late too much. We don't want to have to deal with that. So really in those situations, we probably should have a meeting with somebody go, hey, man, you keep coming in late. I don't know why. I don't really care why. You just need to come here on time, okay? I don't want to have to write you up. I don't want to have to do that. Please don't make me do that. Come in on time. So we normally have more positive ways that we can get people to do the things that we want them to do. It's not automatically disciplinary action. Oh, one thing that's a side note, by the way, if you have one or two employees who are beyond the pale with the rules, like taking long lunches or maybe way out of the dress code, don't send a memo to everybody in the company or the department and telling everybody to show up on time and everybody to adhere to the, to the dress code. You know, have some courage. Sit down with the people that you have the problem with and let them know that you have a problem with it. This is the policy. This is where you're out of the policy. Knock it off and let's move forward. There's nothing that's worse than that because, first of all, everybody, pretty much everybody knows who you're talking about. And secondly, you're going to have people who you're not addressing who might be offended by that. They might search their conscience and go, hey, wait a second. The other day I wore this, this, and this. Are they upset about that? Maybe I gained a few pounds and maybe it looked a few a little bit tight. I feel like I'm being called out here. And then you have to sit down and you explain, no, it's not you that I was talking about. It was so-and-so. and they're to... Don't do that. So the disciplinary process, the first part about the disciplinary process is, you know, having your work rules or, you know, setting your goals and having work rules around your goals and making sure that you have the rule in place. Is there a rule? Does the rule exist? Or is this just something in my mind? And then we have to communicate those rules, whether that's in policy, whether that's shooting out an email, posting a memo, I don't know, whatever you have, constantly reminding people of what the expectation is and what the rules are. And then if somebody's not obeying those rules, you observe that, and then you are going to take appropriate disciplinary action. That's where that is. That, you know, typically, as I think I talked about before, you know, when you have rules, generally there's a reason behind the rules. And if there's if the reason is gone, get rid of the rules. I mean, there companies, our company's been around for 55 years. I'm sure over 55 years, there's rules that we've had to establish and the rules that we had to get rid of. So a good example of how rules get set and how things happen, I think I told you guys about this earlier this semester, I was in the office and all of a sudden I heard a loud boom and the power went out. So we all went outside to figure out what the heck happened. And there was a dump truck that was fully extended that hit the power line, the main power line that serves our entire area. Knocked it all out, knocked, knocked the, the main leg of power, so we lost power. And we all had to go home, and I guess thank goodness for COVID. Wow, that's the first thing I've ever said that. We were all equipped to go back home and, and work for the rest of the day because we had no power. But that's what happened. We, we completely lost power. We lost power to our servers. We lost power to everything. We had to get all of our backups going. Everything happened. And the guy who extended his uh, uh, dump truck, he had it all the way up. I don't know if I said dump truck or forklift. I meant dump truck if I said forklift. But he had his dump truck all the way extended and the power line laying on top of it. And sparks are flying. He's running away from the dump truck. So the very next day, there's a big, big sign, huge yellow and black sign that says, Warning! Overhead power lines. And it's still there right now. They're working on that construction site and they got that big, big sign that's there as soon as you get there. So that's kind of what happens with company policy. You don't think of anything until it happens. And then it's like, oh, crap, we need a rule about this. We need to stop it. So, so dress code. If you go to a company and they've got a very, very specific dress code, there's probably somebody's name that's attached to that. Maybe they still work there. Maybe they don't. But that's generally why you have a lot of those rules. Something happened. If you have very, very strict driving rules, you know, how's my driving and cameras and dashboard things or whatever, chances are pretty good that somebody probably did something really stupid in a company vehicle and it made it necessary for comp the company to do that to make sure nobody did something stupid again. So a lot of times we have those things that happen. Now, when we establish those new rules because of what happened, because we're paying out money, which 
which is against our organizational goals. We establish those rules. We need to communicate those rules to employees, and we need to communicate them well. Had a circumstance with, uh, speaking of driving, had a circumstance where we had a lot of at-fault auto accidents with a particular location. So I alerted management and said, look, guys, we're having a lot of at-fault accidents, a lot of people being careless, backing into things, hitting other people, rolling through stop signs. We really need to tighten this up. I said, okay, we're on it. We're on it. So about four or five days later, I had an employee come into my office and said, my boss discriminates against Hispanics. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, I got into an accident. I was at fault. And I'm suspended without pay for two weeks. And nobody else has ever been suspended without pay for two weeks. So I said to the employee, well, let me look into it. I said, I think I know what happened. Let me find out. So I called the manager and I said, so walk me through the process. He said, well, I took what you had to heart, what you said to heart. And the first guy that got into the accident, I suspended him for two weeks. And I said, well, that's great, but you missed one very, very crucial step. Had you gotten your entire team together and sent out a memo, had them all sign it or just were present in a meeting and said, hey, the next one of you guys that gets into an at-fault auto accident, I'm going to take away your truck and I'm going to suspend you for two weeks. Are we understood? And then they all say yes and then they go on their merry way. You can't just willy-nilly just establish a new rule and not tell anybody about it, especially when it's that stringent. I mean, you're taking away somebody's pay for two weeks. So the manager didn't feel good about it because I told him, you have to tell him to come back and we have to pay him for the days that he has been out. You can't do that. So you have to be very, very careful. That middle piece, communicating the rules. You can't just have secret rules and then take disciplinary action. I mean, certain things are self-explanatory, right? Like stealing and threatening people with violence. So approaches to disciplinary action, you know, the hot stove rule. As soon as somebody does something, you should let them know what's going on. So just like when you touch a hot stove, you burn your hand. If somebody does something wrong, they need to be told that it was wrong. You don't just add it up. You don't just wait until their review. You don't wait two months. You know, one of the things with one of the managers who's thankfully retired in certain respects in my organization, one of the things he used to do is he used to write up a book about employees and, and he would have all these things and all these reasons to fire them. And then he would go search out a new employee and he would wait a month and a half, two months to find a new employee to replace them. And as soon as he had the replacement, then he would go and fire them. Well, you really can't do that. I mean, if you take a longer period of time to fire somebody, especially if you're firing them for, for a pretty logical reason, somebody with a, a big safety violation or somebody who has done something that's, that's detrimental to the organization, if you're saying, hey, I'm firing this person because they did conduct detrimental to the organization and, and they can't stay here anymore. Well, if you let them stay for two months, it's kind of hard to make that argument. Um, you know, the next thing, progressive disciplinary action. We should have appropriate disciplinary action to the crime. I mean, the punishment needs to fit the crime that, you know, somebody coming in late the first time we, they come in late, we don't fire them that typically we're going to we're going to look at things the more serious that it is we might immediately go to written warning or suspension you know, for example somebody that fails a, a drug test or one of those things obviously that's not uh, uh, just a meeting to recalibrate our expectations on 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 drug testing but certain things you know hey we we may have a meeting with somebody disciplinary action without punishment we might sit them down and say look you need to get your act together you need to figure this out that may be your first step you know we may call that a verbal warning we also may just call it a meeting or a calibration i like the calibration so this is sort of a decision tree with disciplinary action you know we, how how serious is the infraction how far do we want to go so that's all in your book. You, know, you can take a look at that if you want. But ultimately, if somebody's not doing what we want them to do, they're going to get fired. So some problems with that. Managers don't like it. Managers don't like to write people up. They don't like to do it. And a lot of times you let things build up. You let things build up. In the second one here, you're too lenient early and then you're way too strict later that you get to a point where you're just ready to fire somebody. And that's always the, the, the kicker, the thing that you, you have to really look at. Are you have you made a decision and then you're building your case? Meaning, have have you already decided you're going to fire somebody and now you're just getting the documentation together? You've gotten to the point where you man, you can't even stand to hear them breathe. 
you're just ready to get him out of the building. So I'm going to just find every little ticky tack thing. I'm just going to wait. Gosh, I really hope they're not on time today because I'm really ready to fire them. Right. So sometimes that happens. Sometimes we let people go. We let people go. We let people go. And then all of a sudden they foil our plans because then they become model employees. And dang it, I made the decision to fire them. We shouldn't really be doing this in an ideal environment as managers. What you should be doing is you should be gathering evidence to make a decision. Not making a decision and gathering evidence. You see the difference in that? So if, you, if you're gathering evidence to make a decision, you say, okay, is this a good employee or a bad employee? I'm going to gather evidence. Okay, I'm going to go back and look. And how many days were they late this week? That's a lot different than standing at the door with a stopwatch to see when they're going to show up because you're ready to write them up. Um, you know, another problem with that, too, is w- we want to praise in public. We want to discipline in private. We want to make sure that that really we, we find the right place to do it. We find the right time. Do we want to do this at fr- on a Friday afternoon so they have the weekend to think about it? Or, or do we want to do them on a Monday morning so they start the week off right? And it really depends on the employee and it depends on the situation. So we need to carefully think that out. Where are we going to have that? You know, if we if we have a, a management or we have an office that's like a fishbowl where everybody can see what's going on and they can see what's what, what we're doing, you know, that's uncomfortable for the employee. The employee may not may just want to get the hell out of there as quickly as possible. So we have to be careful that we do pick the right place to do that. So termination, that, that generally when we fire somebody, we should terminate them for just cause. We should have a good reason for that. And, and that's going to be based on our work rules, and it's also going to be based on certainly the severity of it. That if somebody accidentally does something, that's different than if they do it on purpose. There's a difference between somebody who's involved in an auto accident because they're careless and somebody who's involved in an auto accident because they're drunk and texting. I mean, those are going to be completely different things. The other thing with termination, too, is is in order to do it right, you shouldn't have one person making the termination decision. Now, there are certain circumstances where, look, somebody does something way out of bounds. Uh, if, if somebody's on a job site, the superintendent shows up talking to the guy. The guy threatens the superintendent. He runs to his truck. He grabs a, a pipe wrench, starts running after a superintendent. The superintendent is well within his rights once he's in a safe place to say, hey, you're fired. Now, now that hasn't happened in my organization, and I hope it never does. But that would be something that you really probably, at the heat of the moment, can terminate somebody. But other than that, you shouldn't be heat of the moment terminating anybody. Just shouldn't be doing that. So there should be a policy, whether it, it's run through HR and senior management, depending on the size of your organization, might be the the, the department lead or the division head that is uh, is the person that's responsible for blessing that decision. We don't want somebody just haphazardly terminating because you know it's not fair to the employee, number one. Number two is it's subject to legal jeopardy. And number three, if the manager's a hothead, they might be stopping us from achieving organizational goals because they're just quickly just ready to fire somebody. So when we fire people, these are my tips on, on how to do that. You know, first thing is, you know, pick the appropriate time. When are we going to do that? Does it have to be done immediately? Can it be done at the end of the day? Do we want to do it in a, in a time where there are less people there, whether that's first thing in the morning or last thing in the day? Is there, you know, if we're terminating somebody for performance, we have a time frame for that. If we're terminating somebody because they've done something really, really bad, obviously the time frame is a little bit different. We can't really wait too long to do that because we need to exit them out of the organization as quickly as possible. So when we actually pick the appropriate time and and you want to probably throw in there is is just plan what you're going to do, plan what you're going to say, plan how the meeting is going to go. Just like you do with with interviews, you want to kind of center yourself and think about what you're going to do. Once you get the employee in there, though, you want to do the termination quickly. You want to let them know within probably 15 to 20 seconds that it's the purpose of the meeting. If somebody, you know, I'm calling in an employee, we'll just call him Buddy. I've got a dog named Buddy. So <laughs> I'm going to fire my dog. So Buddy, uh, we've had three meetings before about your attendance. And we told you the last time that we had a meeting that if it didn't improve that we were uh, would consider terminating your employment. Unfortunately, you missed three days last week. And we're going to have to let you go. I'm sorry. So that's kind of where you do it. However you say it, don't say that somebody's terminated or fired. Uh, those are kind of words that, that make people bristle. We're going to have to let you go. Unfortunately, you know, this is, you know, we're, we're, we're at the end of our rope and, and, you know, this is it. However you want to do it. 
try to stay away from from termination. If you are going to say, don't tell them they're terminated, tell them their employment is terminated. That's a little bit better if you want to use that terminology. But once you've done that, then you just you're quiet. I mean, if you've taken sales training, you know, the silent spot, whoever talks wins, you kind of let them go. You let them give their objections. Uh, you know, how do, what are they, you know, what is their issue? Well, wait a minute. How, how come, you know, why can't I get another chance or this is, this is crap. Why are you doing this to me? And we, you know, obviously the same way that we do things with, with sales techniques from handling objections and sales, you know, I understand you feel that way. I, I apologize. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, this is a decision that was not entered in lightly. That's when we shift into the neutral language, the company. We have decided this is not a decision uh, that was made by me personally. This is a company decision. We have expectations. You need to live by those expectations. Unfortunately, you didn't. Um, no, no bearing on you. It's not about you. So neutral means it's not about them and it's not about us. So we're, we're talking about the behavior. We're not talking about the person. So we have to be very, very careful that we don't do that because then we become adversarial and it can get ugly really quick. And when it gets ugly, who knows what might happen? I mean, there might be violence. I mean, people are losing something. You have to remember that when you're doing that, when you're terminating somebody, that that they are they're thinking about how they're going to pay the mortgage. They're thinking about how they're going to make their car payment, about their financial goals. They're thinking about what they're going to tell their family, what they're going to tell their spouse. So they're feeling all sorts of horrible emotions right then and there. And you know, you go sort of the least common denominator at that point. You're at sort of the fight or flight. Uh, place. So you don't want to get them in a position where they're going to fight. And you also don't want the flight. You don't want them to run away. So you want to start with the worst. You want to get better. You know, think about it. You push them down and then you're going to start lifting them up. Look, I understand that you're upset. You know, we we don't really want to leave you empty handed. We have uh, your benefits. We've got uh, PTO. We're going to pay you for a certain amount of PTO that this is a uh, termination for performance, not for cause. You can still use this as a reference. We'll give you a neutral reference. However you want to do that in order to make them feel lifted up. We want them to feel positive when when they leave. Um, I said handling objections. You handle a few of those, but you don't want to argue. You also don't want to rehash. You're also not there. It's not a disciplinary meeting. You're not there to tell them all the things that you did wrong. You've already made the decision. The decision is final. It's done. Don't match their anger. Try to use a little bit of different body language. If they're a little bit angry, try to sit back a little bit. You're in control. Always, always, always have a witness. Very, very important that you have somebody else that's there. People are less likely to lie if there's somebody else that's there. And really our number one risk with employment law is firing people. That's our number one risk because it's easiest to quantify. It's really easy. I had a job and then I didn't have a job. It's a lot easier than I didn't get a job or I didn't get a promotion or I didn't get a raise or all those other things. They could have other explanations, other reasons, other possibilities, other whatever. You either have a job or you don't. So it's pretty easy to quantify that loss. So it's, it's important that you have a witness. You want to think about all the possible outcomes beforehand and any issues that the person might have. So that might mean how you're going to clean out their desk. How are they going to exit the building? In our organization, they have a company truck and a cell phone. How are we going to do that? How are we going to get that information back from them? Are they going to have personal items on their cell phone that we're going to need to clear off of that? Are they going to have personal items in their truck? Do they have personal tools? Do we have to drive them home? Are we going to call an Uber? Are they going to leave their truck and then come back and get the equipment from it? All those things we have to think about. And we have to think about how they're going to exit the building, possible outcomes. Are they going to be somebody that's going to be angry and screaming? Is there going to be need to be somebody else that's there? Maybe we might need to get the police involved. I don't know. We need to think about all those things. Next thing is you want to get all your stuff back before the final paycheck clears. We can deduct somebody down to minimum wage, but we can't deduct them any further. But if you have PTO or if you have anything else, you can withhold that until you get your laptop back or your phone, all those other things. The final things is always be respectful, polite, and empathetic, but direct and control. And in control, you know, you, you you want to be direct. You are in control. This is your meeting. It's not their meeting. And people who get up and walk away, that's that's a sign of control. So if, if we're offering somebody something, their PTO or other information, they get up and walk away. You know, hey man, if you don't want to hear what you got, I guess you don't get it. Um, but we do want to main, maintain that control. You want to be empathetic in the fact that you know, I I I can understand. 
uh, how how you're feeling, you know, empathetically. But we don't want to say it like that. I understand how you feel. No, you don't. No, you don't. Because you know what? You still have a job. And you're still going to get a paycheck. And you still have all those things. Your life didn't just get turned upside down. So when we're empathetic, we say, you know what? I can understand why you're upset. You don't understand how they feel, though. Even if it's happened to you before, you don't understand how they feel in that moment. And don't even say that because they're just going to get madder and madder. I've, I've seen managers do it so many times. I understand how you feel. No, you don't. You really, really don't understand how they feel because you're not feeling that right now. So be careful. So, so being empathetic and saying, look, I understand you came in today, you had a job, tomorrow you don't, uh, we're going to offer you a, a, a letter of recommendation, we're going to pay your benefits, you still have PTO left, however you can be positive for them. And then finally apologize, don't apologize for firing, but say, you know, I'm really sorry this didn't work out. I really, I really, you know, really think a lot of you. I think you're a, a good person and, and uh, you know, it really sucks that, that it had to end this way. You know, thanks for everything you did. Uh, you know, who knows? Maybe our past may cross in the future. Obviously, if you're terminating somebody for gross misconduct, you're not going to apologize. You're not going to do anything. It's like, take your crap and get out of here. You stole from the company. But for most of our terminations, they're not going to be that way. So, I mean, if we're good to people on the way out the door, they don't sue us. Uh, they, they're not going to be workplace violence. They're not going to feel like their whole world was shattered and that, that we shattered it, that we can do nice things for people, whether that's keeping their benefits active for a month, making sure their PTO gets paid out, explaining to them how they get access to their 401k. All those things should be part of your termination process. So we're going to probably treat people a little bit differently. That When you get to the executive level, you know where all the bodies are buried. So generally when you're at the higher levels of the company, there's a lot more things that you have to consider. There's a lot more moving parts than if you're terminating somebody that's just been with the organization for three weeks and they're in sort of a production role. So we have to be careful uh, on that and how we plan that, how we look at that, You know, benefit levels, letters of recommendation, we might look at uh, l some sort of uh, non-disclosure, non-compete with with a certain level of of severance. You know, in exchange for this, you will give us this. You won't go after our customers. You won't go after our employees. It's very important that you consider that. And it's really easy to sit there and beat beat your chest and go, "I'm not going to pay that guy anything. He did this, this, this." Well, sometimes you have to protect your business interest. And I'm sorry if you're not at the management level, but when you are at the management level, you can do more things to hurt the company. So you do have to consider that. And maybe your policies and your procedures on termination, how much severance you pay, whether you have a severance agreement, whether you have any other sort of... Uh, termination perks, if you will, uh, golden parachutes, as they call them, it's going to vary based on what level you are in the company. So one of the things that we we have to look at is is downsizing. And, and fortunately, we haven't had to deal with this for a while. I had to deal with this when I did mergers and acquisitions at my last job and hated that. You'd buy a company and you'd basically eliminate the entire management staff and then keep all the production staff. The other thing with downsizing too is in a down economy like what we had in the Great Recession, we were we were struggling. We uh, we declined. Our, I mean, our business declined by you know thirty three percent. We went from sixty seven million down to forty two million. I think that's about what that number is. It might even be higher than that. But yeah, it was a significant reduction in the size of our company. We closed down offices. I mean, we we just we were trying to survive. And sometimes you have to restructure. Sometimes you have to change some things. Um, you know, and this it's tough. It's hard. It's it's it, you know, growth is hard too, and and trying to grow for people. But it's even harder than that to to try to make it the right decision. Because a lot of times too, when you look at at uh, unemployment, unemployment is usually a lagging indicator. Generally, people are laying people off right when the business is starting to grow. So. And that's what it is. It's typically a reaction because you, you, you want to hang on to people as long as humanly possible. Let's hang on to them. And then you get to the very end and you're actually uh, coming out of it and then you're letting people go. I mean, it's sort of like if you're if you're coasting down to a stop stoplight and all of a sudden it turns green, it's hard to get that momentum back, right? Because your, your momentum is to stop and to slow or whatever. And then now you try to hit the gas and it's like, well, I can't get the gas because I'm slowing down. And that's kind of what happens a lot of time in downsizing. It really... It really sucks. It's not a good situation to be in. 
And you hope that the, the decisions that you make are, are quasi-permanent, that you're not going to be just sort of downsizing one day and then growing the same thing the next day. That, you know, we, sh- we, we cut this department in half, and then within six months, we're trying to bring it all back. Publicly traded companies end up doing that a lot, and it's really just a pain. So negative effects of downsizing, and of course there are a lot. You know, you've got that grieving period that employees are down there, and they're also con- concerned that hey, I might be next, so so I'm going to look for another job. Uh, you know, advancement opportunities. We got we may have gotten rid of de- uh, departments and divisions and management levels. Maybe the span of controls increased. Well, that middle level of management is is a, a less of an opportunity for me to be a part of of company advancement and, and my leadership pipeline. It's going to reduce loyalty. That people are going to feel less safe. That the company is going to take care of them. So it's sort of every person for themselves. You lose that institutional memory. You lose a lot of talent. You lose a lot of resources, and it requires other people to do a lot more things. And the final thing here is what I just was saying about about you know it being usually unemployment being a lagging indicator of the economy because companies wait too long to do the downsizing that they were going to do, or they do it as a reaction, not necessarily as a proactive measure. And then you've cut too deep and you can't, you can't, you can't right size it. You can't, you can't get back to it. Um, You know, the, the other thing with it too is a negative effect of it. Typically it negatively affects older workers, older employees, because they usually make more money. Usually they are less, um, less flexible. In what they're doing, they're they're kind of coasting near the end, and you know they've been around for a while. Also, they may be working and doing jobs that are becoming obsolete, and it's just the the, the fact of life that that you know once you get to be in your fifties and sixties, you do have to worry a lot more about downsizing, which sucks because you're trying to plan for retirement and you're trying to work out the string to be able to go. So. That is a a serious negative effect of it. And as I get into my 50s, I have to think about that a lot more than I did when I was just a young kid in my 30s. Those of you in your 20s are going, 30s? That's not a kid. Uh, Worker Adjustment and Retraining Notification Act, which is known as WARN. You are required if you are an employer that uh, has a mass layoff uh, of more than 100 employees. You do have to let people know. Now, you don't have to let the person know who's getting that. I mean, you don't have to like publish a layoff list and say within 60 days, the following employees will be laid off, but you have to notify them that there will be a layoff coming. Or if you are going to be closing a plant that you have to notify people. Now there are certain circumstances like the company goes bankrupt. Like, what are you going to do if they go bankrupt? I mean, it's, it's uh, they, they go, they're gone. And that happens to people sometimes as they show up for work and there's a sign on the door. We're closed. Because they went belly up. They went bankrupt. So the business goes out of business. Warren is out the window. But other than that, there are violations if you don't properly notify your employees that it's coming. Because you want to give them a chance to go find something else to do. So severance pay is very, very important. And it's important to do for layoffs, especially with your older workers. Because what you're able to do with severance pay is you're able to do a general release of claims, which waives their right to recovery. Now, they don't waive their right to testify. They don't waive their right to be involved in that. But they do uh, waive their right to recovery under that specific law. So if you've done your severance agreement properly and you followed the right recommendations on notification of rights under the severance policy, then someone could basically waive their right to recovery under the Age Discrimination Employment Act, under EEO laws, under Title VII, under ADA, et cetera, et cetera. There's no federal law that requires severance, but typically companies will have a severance policy where they will pay a certain number of weeks per year uh, I got laid off once and I got severance. It's only happened to me one time very, very early in my career back in 1994, January of 94. And 
I got two weeks. I had only been with the company like nine months, but that was their minimum. It was two weeks. And then after after that, it was a week per year. So like anybody that was within their within their first year to one year, they got two weeks. And then it was three weeks after two years and four weeks after four, three years, et cetera, et cetera. Um, generally, there's a maximum amount you're going to pay. I don't know, 12 weeks or 16 weeks. Um, but it can get kind of cra- kind of crazy. I mean, especially with your your long term employees, you got somebody that's been there for for you know thirty years or something. Some companies pay two weeks per year. You might get sixty uh, sixty weeks of severance, so you get paid for a year. Um, or you might get a package. You might get a lump sum uh, payment uh, that's done as your severance that that's given to you. And, and you want to get that general release and you want to make sure that that general release is blessed by an attorney. Um, it's extremely important that we get that release and, and we are very specific on how we do that. One of the things that um, I, I think is very important is that regardless, if you're paying somebody severance or money that you don't owe them, that's beyond a certain amount. I mean, not, not if you're going to pay. It's like, hey, we're going to pay you through the end of the week. You, you fire somebody on a Wednesday and you say, hey, we're going to pay you through the end of the week. That's a lot different than, you know, we're going to give you two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. I'm, I'm of the mindset that it can't hurt. I mean, give them enough severance pay that it's worth their while to sign the agreement and have them sign the agreement because, you, you don't want somebody coming back to you. You know, a lot of times they're going to sign when they're right there. And there are rights of rescission. I mean, there's certain things that you have to put in there that you have have seven days to change your mind. Uh, if you are in uh, in the in the course of a ADEA uh, claim that that ADEA requires that you give them 21 days to review the document. So if they're not ADEA, you can pressure them to sign. So if they're if they're under 40 or if you don't think there's any sort of risk under ADEA for them uh, to sue under that, then then you can pressure them to sign at the moment. Say, look, this this offer is only on the table for this long. If you sign it and you change your mind, you can change it in seven days. But but, you know, you either you either take the deal I'm giving you or you go. You can't do that. I mean, you, you somebody can't waive their rights under ADEA. Uh, if you pressure them to sign it uh, when it's there. But if you have any specific questions about terminations, if you have specific questions about employee discipline, severance pay, any of that kind of stuff, uh, again, you know, 21, 22 years, whatever it is in, in HR management and prior to that in, in selling HR services, yeah, I, I've seen a lot. I've done a lot. I've been involved in a lot of different things. You know, wisdom comes from... Wisdom comes from experience, and experience comes from screwing up, basically. You know, so a lot of times you do the wrong thing, and it's like, oh crap! So we need to change our practice, we need to change our policy, we need to change our documents. So I forgot in the middle. So let's uh, end this thing with uh, with with I don't know. What's your craziest HR story? So what's the weirdest thing that you've ever experienced, or maybe that you've heard about? of somebody that got fired, maybe somebody threatened a manager and gave him the finger, I don't know, keyed the manager's car. I don't know, weird weird stuff like that, like any weird sort of employee relations stories. I mean, I've got plenty of them. I've got people running around. I had one guy that that totally freaked out and was throwing tools and we brought him into the into the conference room to to let him go and he didn't have a ride. I guess his girlfriend had dropped him off. And I still remember the guy's name. I can't say it, but but it's funny. You just remember these names. And this is, gosh, this is probably going back 10 years. And it, w- this is before Uber. So we had to call him a cab. So we're waiting for the cab to come. And back in the old days of cabs, they weren't real reliable. It took a while. So we had to kind of babysit him in the conference room for about an hour. And he alternated between screaming and punching his head to apologizing and begging for his job back. So that was probably one of the most uncomfortable hours of my entire life. So that is probably my my top of the head best story. Anyway, give me your best shot. Thank you, everybody. Hopefully you're going well in the projects. If you're having any problems, issues, or you want me to review anything, I am willing to do that, and I'll shut up now. Have a great week.